Well, when all of God's children we get together. and welcome. Welcome once again, friends. Good morning, Mom. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Pray that your travels are safe, that you guys are enjoying yourselves selves, and you'll get home safely, Mom. Good morning, Chuck. Good morning. Good morning, my brother. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Dennis. Good morning, Jalisa. Good morning, Joy. Uh, good morning to Sister Arnita, my beautiful Sister Arnita. Good morning to the beautiful Lad family. Good morning. Good morning to you, my brother, 
uh, Brother Burrell, Brother Marshall, Brother Daryl, good morning. Sister Simantia, good morning. Sister Darlene, good morning. Sister Mariah, Sister uh, uh, Sybil, Sybil, good morning. Good morning, sis. Good morning to you, Miss Linda, Miss Sonia, Miss Sheila, Miss Charlotte. Good morning. Good morning to each and every one of you. Good morning to you, my, my good brother, Brother Curry, Brother Roney. Good morning to you all. Friends, there's too many to name. Just too many to name. Uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of God's children ought to say amen on this morning. The psalmist said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That means if you got breath in your body today, there ought to be some praise coming out of your mouth on this morning. Friends, there ought to be some praise not only in this place, but wherever you are on today. Our God is worthy to be praised. He's worthy of the highest praise. Look back over your life. Consider what he's done for you just on today. The least you can do is show him some appreciation for all that he has done and continues to do in your life. No, friends, I don't need the song leader to encourage me. I don't need the preacher to get me excited. I don't need anybody else's testimony. I got my own. I know when I look back over my life that it was God and only God who's been with me, protecting me, caring for me. God is good. He's not just good to me. He's good to everybody. He's good to you, too. Oh, no, friends. Uh, I don't need anybody to tell me how good God has been in my life. I know he's been good in your life. He's a show sure enough good God. I don't need anybody to put a gun to my head or a knife to my throat. If I die today, God doesn't owe me anything. I owe him everything. Oh, I hope you came to give God some praise on today. And what a wonderful day for God's children, his people everywhere to come together as a family, one body of believers to worship him in spirit and in truth. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord just to give thanks to the name of the Lord. And friends, I believe it's also a good reason for us to be here today. Friends, I am Evangelist Davis Worley, and on behalf of the saints who worship right here in Sandtown, West Baltimore, Maryland, I pray the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ upon you all, and I bid you greetings, friends. We welcome you uh, once again to our worship via live stream. As always, it is our absolute pleasure to invite you into our worship, and we are absolutely delighted that you have chosen to spend just a few moments of your time with us today. Friends, we know that there are many other things that you could be doing, but God placed it on your heart to visit with us, and for that reason, we are eternally grateful. Friends, here at the Church of Christ in Sandtown, we are determined to give God the praise that he and only he so rightly deserves by any means necessary. Here in the Church of Christ in Sandtown, we honor God as we have been taught by example of those before us. According to Acts chapter 20, verse number 7, and 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Upon the first day of the week, which is today. Friends, our love for Jesus keeps us strong, encouraged, uplifted, and focused on praising him. No matter the obstacles, viruses, germs, disease, pestilence, or unreliability of men. We know that our God is a conqueror. We know he's a shield. He's a defender. He's a comforter. He's a mighty warrior. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He hears the cry of his children, and he always comes to our defense. First Peter chapter 3, verse number 12 tells us that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are always open to our prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Friends, our God has never, ever lost a battle, and he never, ever will. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our God and our Father, most holy and eternal, the one true God, the only God. Father, we humble ourselves beneath the throne of grace on this morning just to glorify you, to give you honor, to give you the praise that you and only you so rightly deserve. 
Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, whom you sent into this world to redeem us to you. Father, there are not enough tongues. There are not enough words. There are not enough hallelujahs that we can offer up to you to demonstrate our, grat our gratitude, Father. To tell you how grateful we are that you have demonstrated your love toward us. And Father, please forgive us for we know that we often fail, Father, in our demonstration to show our love to you. Father, sometimes we fall short. We say and do things, Father, that we shouldn't. We think, have thoughts, Father, that we shouldn't. And these things, Father, cause us to find ourselves in opposition to you and your will. So we simply ask, Father, on this morning that you would please forgive us of our many sins. Forgive us of anything, Father, that we may have said, thought, or done that is not pleasing or in accordance with your will. Please, Father, do as you have promised us in your word that if we repent of our sins, you'll be just to forgive us and remember our sins no more. Father, we humbly come before your throne of grace this morning on behalf of your children all over the world. We pray for each and every one, Father. All of us stand in need of something. Many of us, Father, stand in need of healing. Many stand in need of comfort, Father. Many are mourning the loss of loved ones. Many are dealing with marital issues, Father, family issues substance abuse, Father, other types of abuse. Help us, Father. Bless us. Strengthen us where we are weak and where we are strong, Father. Help us to share our strength with the weaker ones around us. Help us, Father, that we might lift each other and lift up this world, Father, for your Son, Jesus. Strengthen our feet, Father, that we might go out into this world. That we might seek and bring lost souls into your kingdom. Help us, Father, that we might demonstrate the love of your Son in this world. Help us that not only we, Father, but all that we bring to you might stay on the straight and righteous path. Father, we love you. And we pray, Father, for the leadership all around the world, Father. We pray for presidents, kings, queens, Father, princes, rulers of all kinds. Father, please bless them and help them that they might come to the table of conference and find ways of peace, Father, that warring will cease that unnecessary death will cease. That people might come back together, Father, come back to their homes and begin to repair their lives. And help us, Father, your children, that we not close people out, but that we welcome them with open arms, Father, and provide the help that they need. Help us that we might share our resources, not just in our nation, Father, but all around the world. Bless us, your children, Father, as we continue in this worship to you. We pray, dear Lord, that the things we say and do here on today will rise up to you a sweet-smelling aroma, pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Father, please, we ask, allow your spirit to rest upon us. And guide us where you would have us to go. It is in the most holy and blessed name of your Son, our Lord, our Savior, our High Priest, and our King, Jesus the Christ, that we do humbly pray. Amen. Friends, welcome to the Church of Christ. We want you to relax. We want you to be at ease. We want you to be at peace. Be comforted. And rest your troubled soul right here with us. Please join us now 
as we worship God in congregational singing with song leaders from all over the Church of Christ, as we lift up our voices in holy praise to God in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I woke up this morning with my Oh, Lord, the 
morning, good morning, good morning, saints, and welcome. Welcome once again, friends. Friends, now it's time for our scripture reading. So get your Bibles, get your Bibles, get your Bibles. We want you to read along with us at home as I read to you aloud. And our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, Old Testament. Go back to the Old Testament this morning. Open, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. Stop at chapter number 8. 1 Samuel chapter number 8. And this morning we will be examining verses 1 through 9. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and the verses are 1 through 9. And friends, I'll be reading from the King James Version on this morning. And God's word reads... Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Bathsheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you. They have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the days that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing, to the reading of his word, but most of all to those who obey his holy and divine word. Friends, let's pray together. Dear Lord, our God and our Father, most holy and eternal, we humble ourselves, Father, again this morning beneath your throne of grace, just thanking you for this beautiful day, Father, thanking you for all of your many rich blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But, Father, we also thank you for your word, which instructs us, teaches us, encourages us, Father, and shows us the direction that you would have us to go. And Father, we pray for those who are in our listening and viewing audience who may not have obeyed the life-saving gospel message of your Son, Jesus. Our hope and our prayer on this morning, Father, is that your word will go forth and do that which you have intended for it to do. That one's heart might be pricked, their understanding might be opened, and they might ask that faithful question, what must I do to be saved? Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege of allowing us to worship you. Father, we humbly ask that you would allow your spirit to continue to rest upon us and lead us where you would have us to go. It is in the most holy and blessed name of your Son, our Lord, our Savior, our High Priest, and our King, Jesus the Christ, that we do humbly pray. To walk with me, my own Jesus, to walk with me. While I'm open, tears turn.
morning, good morning, saints, and welcome. Welcome once again, friends. Friends, as the old preacher once said, I'm not going to hold you long. But for the next few minutes, I am going to try to hold you strong. Friends, I pray that you realize how blessed you are and appreciate the many wonderful blessings God is bestowing upon you every day. But more importantly, I pray that today, right now, you will establish, strengthen, and prioritize a spiritual relationship with God. I hope that you will commit yourselves to pursuing and maintaining a true relationship with the Lord, that you will put God first and pursue His will and purpose for your life. My friends, one cannot say that he's a child of God if he doesn't have a relationship with God. So today we want to encourage the sinner, strengthen the faithful, call the erring saint back home, and encourage all to stay home. Y'all come on home. It's time. It's time to come home. Friends, this morning we want you to consider your relationship with God in Christ and ask yourself, is it where it should be? Do you have a relationship with God? Or are you simply having an affair with God? Is God prioritized in your life? And have you committed yourself to serving Him? Friends, we all make difficult decisions from time to time. Sometimes we make decisions that don't turn out well for us. That's why it's never good to make crucial decisions when we're emotional, uh, under duress, or uh, don't have all the facts to make the right decision. Making ill-informed decisions may cause you to regret the decision you make. Your decision should be based on what you know, not how you feel. But sometimes emotions override our intellect. And we do things that are not always in our best interest. Another way we err in our decision-making process is when we make decisions based on the ideology or beliefs of others. When we go along to get along. That's never a good practice because groups don't always make decisions based on facts. And they seldom think rationally about the choices they make. There's a psychological term for it called groupthink. Groupthink is a psychological tendency that occurs when a group prioritizes consensus and conformity over critical thinking, resulting in poor decision making. It causes groups to ignore risk, dismiss opposing opinions, and overlook flaws in the decision-making process. Group members believe their decisions are correct, and they de develop uh, explanations to justify their decisions and ignore warnings that propose consequences that could result from the group's thinking. Eventually, members will censor themselves and set aside their own personal beliefs under pressure for group unanimity. And they'll accept viewpoints that represent a perceived group consensus, even though all group members don't believe that it's correct or what's best for the group. This urge to conform enables people to make certain, certain types of decisions, including those that are irrational, extreme, unwise, or unrealistic. And at the sunset of the recent political season, it's obvious that one group was able to make an argument strong enough to persuade a substantial number of people to join them in selecting and electing the one whom they chose to be the leader of this nation. 
Thus my shamanic proposition for your intellectual consideration this morning is you choose the president. I choose the king. You choose the president. I choose the king. Samuel, called by God to be a prophet to his people Israel, lived and served in the temple of God. Many of us like to boast of our tenure in the Lord's church. Folk always talking about how long they've been in the church. I was brought up in the church. I've been in the church all my life. But if anyone had a right to say he was a member of the Lord's church all his life, it was Samuel. It was Samuel. He began his ministry as a child, preordained from his mother's womb to serve in the Lord's temple. As a child, Samuel ministered before the Lord, adorned in priestly attire, an ephod, linen apron, draped in a robe. In the Lord's church today, some of y'all would have a fit. If God's minister wore an apron and a robe, you prefer he wears a suit and a tie. Samuel, the child prophet and faithful priest, had favor with the Lord because he walked in the ways of the Lord and did all that God commanded. It is Samuel, God's chosen, who recorded a portion of Israel's history as they moved from the age of Judges to being unified, a unified nation under kings. Samuel was the last judge over Israel, and he anointed two kings, Saul and David. The book of 1 Samuel records the tragic transition of the children of Israel from a theocracy under the judges of God to a monarchy of kings under God's divine rule. Even Saul, the first king, was chosen to serve God and reign over his people Israel. Saul's selection by God to be king was purposeful and intentional. Friends, you should be careful what you ask for. Always make sure your motives are pure and your intentions are aligned with God's will. You see, in their yearning for a king, the children of Israel made a huge error in judgment. They rejected God. And in rejecting God, they made an irreversible decision that would cause them great suffering. Because their motives and their justification for desiring a king were sinful. God gave them a selfish king, one who was arrogant, prideful, stubborn, foolish, and disobedient. Sound like anybody you know? Saul's reign was displeasing to God, and despite Samuel's repeated warnings, he continued to behave irrationally and wickedly. He improperly assumed the role of a priest and offered up sacrifices. He made a foolish vow which almost killed his own son. He destroyed the priest. And he disobeyed God's command to completely destroy the Amalekites. His poor character, lack of judgment, and desire to please the people rather than obey God became intolerable to God. And when God rejected him, he rebelled by refusing to accept God's decision to replace him. In Saul, the children of Israel saw great hope in a new era of leadership. But like all leaders who do not obey God, his life ended tragically and his legacy was forever stained. The word of God shows us and the Apostle Paul tells us that God holds his leaders to a higher accountability for their disobedience. We serve a God who demands his people obey him in all things and in all our ways. And in our scripture reading this morning, we see the children of Israel rejecting God and demanding to have a king like other nations around them. 
and the elders, the leaders of the people who should have known better, took their request for a king to God's anointed judge, Samuel, God's chosen. The group was convinced that Israel should have an earthly king, and they tried to justify their reasons. To his face, they told Samuel, they said, man, you old. You're about to die. You're near the end of your life. Your sons don't exhibit godly qualities nor walk righteously before God. They told him, we want a king, a permanent judge like the nations around us. It was a great idea to them, but it was a wrong choice, a bad decision. Further, we're not careful in our love, honor, and respect for God will pay an eternal price for our disobedience. In life, we make choices that don't always yield the results we desire. And sometimes the things we desire aren't what we need. Choices have consequences. Choices have consequences. And bad choices have bad consequences. Many of you are unhappy right now because of the choices you made. You made. You could have chosen to go right, but you chose to go left. And now you're left in a situation that ain't right for you. Things aren't working out the way you thought they would. But it seemed like a good idea at the time when you made your choice. Many of us have regrets in life because we've made some poor choices, bad choices. And you got to live with the choices you make. You can't go through life blaming all your problems and failures on everybody else. No, you make choices. I make choices. We all make choices that affect and define our station in life. Every bad thing that happens to you ain't everybody else's fault. There's some situations, outcomes in your life that are a result of the choices you made. And you must accept and live with them, whether good or bad. Every bad thing that has happened in your life is it because of someone else's bad choices? Some of it is a result of your bad choices. When you make a bad decision, you can't blame it on anyone else. You made the decision. The problem with some of us is that we don't like to be held accountable for our bad decisions. But accountability starts and ends with you. Accountability is assigned to the person who made the decision. Some of y'all try to use that Flip Wilson excuse as a crutch. Got to be over 50 to know who Flip Wilson is. But you try to use the Flip Wilson excuse. The devil made me do it. The devil may tempt you, but he doesn't make you do anything. The Word of God tells that each of us is tempted when we are drawn away by our own desires and enticed. The devil is doing his job. He only seeks to steal, kill, and destroy you by any means necessary. No, the devil didn't make you do it. You chose to do it. Here's a news flash. It's not the devil. It's God who holds you accountable for the choices you make. That's right. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 10 tells us we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each of us may receive the things done in this body according to what we have done, whether good or bad. You can say the devil made you do it. 
But God is going to hold you accountable for what you did. Every bad choice you've made isn't someone else's fault. No matter the temptation, ultimately, you are the one making the decision. And you are the one who will be held accountable. You knew she could get pregnant before you laid down with her. Now that she's pregnant with your child, you want to blame it on her. How is it all her fault? You played a part in the decision to lie with her. You had a choice and you made your choice. And the choice you made resulted in her pregnancy. Accountability and responsibility fall on you. I'll tell you like the judge said. If it ain't yours, feed it until it looks like you. Help us, Lord. Sister, you knew he wasn't no good when you chose him. You knew it. He showed you. He showed you time and again. His mama tried to warn you. Friends tried to tell you. He couldn't have made it plainer if he tattooed I ain't no good on his forehead. But you think he's the best dish on the menu. He keeps leaving you. You keep taking him back. He disrespects his mama, disrespects his daddy, and he doesn't respect you. He talks to you like you have no uh, uh, emotions, and he treats you worse than an alley dog. But you call it love. Help us, Lord. He won't take care of you, won't take care of his kids. He's broke as a joke. Won't get a job to take care of himself. In fact, he's living off you. You thought you could fix him. Until he finally broke you. Now you realize that you made a decision. A choice. That you now regret. But you got to live with it. You got to live with it. Some of you got friends that... You think the world of you. Love being around them. Do anything for them. And they let you. Oh yeah, they let you. You lend them money. They never pay you back. When you go shopping, you buy them gifts. When you go to restaurants, you pick up the tab. As long as you're spending money, they love having you around. But when you're broke, they don't want to see you. They're too busy. Got other things to do. You get disappointed when they won't take your call. You see, they're not true friends. Everyone who says they're your friend ain't your friend. You thought you knew them. But you really didn't. You chose their friendship. They didn't choose yours. You were buying their friendship rather than make them prove their friendship to you. It was a choice you made. Friends, I'm trying to tell you that sometimes the people you choose will let you down. They'll shock you. Yes, disappoint you. I know. I've had my share of disappointment. People do things that make me shake my head every day. But I've learned well what the psalmist said. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Friends, ain't no flat foot, stank breath, loud mouth, lying man can do you like Jesus. No man can do you like the Lord. I expect people to be exactly who they are. If you lied to me once, you'll lie to me again. If you stole from me once, 
you'll steal from me again. If you said bad things about me before, you'll say bad things about me now. If you broke my trust before and I allowed you to, you'll do it again. Some of y'all get disappointed with people because you expect them to do things they can't and be what they're not. You can't expect people to do things they're not capable of, capable of doing. If it's not in them, you can't get it out of them. People are going to be who they are. Prisons are full of people who are who they are. Courtrooms are full of people who are who they are. The capital is full of people who are who they are. The church is full of people who are who they are. The White House and your house is full of people who are who they are. Help us, Lord. I expect disappointment from people. I'm surprised when they do something I didn't expect them to do. Y'all get that one on the way home. Friends, when you trust people, people will break your trust. They'll disappoint you. Some of us habitually place our trust in the wrong people. Right now, many of you are disappointed by the outcome of the latest election because your candidate didn't win. You're sitting around moping and crying. I'm trying to talk some of y'all off the ledge. You gave your time, your energy, your talent, your resources, and your money to elect your candidate. But you won't give any of those things to Jesus. Help us, Lord. Many of you lost your mind for your candidate. But you won't lose your mind for Jesus. Now, I'm going somewhere. Just stay with me. You chose a president, male or female. But many of you still haven't chosen Jesus. You chose a candidate who said they value and will protect human life. But they're okay with the death penalty. They're okay with any innocent lives being slaughtered all around the world in wars that they have nothing to do with. You chose a candidate who say they believe in God. But don't believe in God's righteousness. Don't exemplify God's righteousness. Don't uphold God's righteousness. And don't abide in God's righteousness. In fact, most disagree, uh, most disagree with and openly oppose God's righteousness. Help us, Lord. You chose a candidate who say they love God. And that's good. That's good. God is love. Anyone who doesn't love doesn't know God. But how can your candidate love God whom they have not seen and hate people they see every day? Help us. Help us, Lord. You selected and elected a candidate for president of the United States. But has your candidate Selected and elect Jesus and elected Jesus to be the head of their life. It matters to you and it matters to them. You selected and elected a candidate for president, but you haven't selected or elected Jesus to be the savior of your life. The president doesn't even know who you are. Probably don't even care. When you need him, he won't be there for you. Secret service won't allow that. When you need a doctor, the president can't heal you. In fact, he might take Obamacare from you. 
When you need justice, he won't petition God on your behalf. When you need comfort and understanding, he won't be there to show you compassion. When you receive an eviction notice, he won't notice. When your marriage is in shambles, it doesn't affect him. He might recommend you divorce. When your money runs out and the bills are rolling in, don't expect him to make your payments. In fact, I've heard many politicians say, uh, that's when you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But that's hard to do when you don't have boots to strap. Friends, politics is like any other sport. But it requires more psychological proficiency than physical strength. You don't need to be 6'5 and 300 pounds full of muscle to be a politician. You don't need the ability to run a 4-3 a in a 100-yard dash. You don't need the skill to jump high or throw long. You need the skills to talk to people, connect with people, persuade people, and win the trust of people to influence them to vote for you. Let me go ahead and close. Because some of y'all are depressed. And I, I'm not trying to depress you. I'm trying to enlighten you. Let me enlighten you. Your vote means something to you, and it should. But it doesn't supersede God's choice. Y'all hear me? Your vote doesn't supersede God's choice. God says... Choose his son, Jesus. Jesus is the right choice. He's the right choice for life, longevity, posterity, happiness, health, wealth, peace, comfort, and eternal life. He's the right choice. You simply need to make the right choice. The power of the president depends on Three other tiers of government, the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. The power of Jesus doesn't depend on any of those things. Jesus has all power in heaven and on earth. It was given to him by God, his Father. He doesn't need to consult with anyone about anything. He doesn't need a vote on any decision he makes. He doesn't need approval from anyone. His decisions are veto-proof. No one can shut his government down. Hell can't prevail against it. He can't be bribed, and he can't be bought. He can't be impeached, and he can't be, he can't be reproached. He doesn't lie. He keeps his promises. He doesn't make promises that he doesn't keep. And he always keeps his word. He doesn't need to run for election or re-election. He's the anointed one. He is now and forevermore. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the head of all government on earth and in heaven. Government rests on his shoulders. He's called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and his peace will never end. He rules upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice for all eternity. The Lord said, Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I have understanding, I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all the judges of the earth. Friends, there's no king, no queen, no Supreme Court justice, no president, unless the Lord approves them. So that means, dear friends, what that means is that your president, 
your king, your emperor, your prince, and your queen all work under the Lord's supervision. No one has greater authority in heaven or on earth than Jesus. You may choose the president, but Jesus has the last say so. I told you, I'm closing, I'm closing. The children of Israel chose a king to be their leader. And in doing so, they rejected God. Now you have an opportunity to choose today, right now. I hope you make the right choice. Don't reject God. Choose Jesus. Why not choose Jesus today? The one who has all power and authority. Even over your president. Who will it be? The president or Jesus? You choose the president. I choose Jesus. Friends, that's my message on this morning. You choose the president. I choose Jesus. Friends, you haven't made the right choice until you choose Jesus. I want to invite you to choose Jesus today. Right now. Choose Jesus. Place your faith in Jesus. Believe the gospel that he is the son of God. That he came to earth and died for our sins rose from the grave the third day. Repent of your sins, which simply means that you make up your mind right now that you want to live right before God. You know the way you're living isn't the way God wants you to. You haven't chosen Jesus. Turn from your sinful lifestyle and choose Jesus. Allow him to be the head of your life. Confess that you believe Jesus is the Son of God. And friends, upon making that faithful confession, you must be baptized. You must be baptized, which is a total bodily submersion in water. In the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the precious gift of the Holy Spirit, which identifies you as a child of God. My friends, you will rise from that water, a new creature in Christ. Your sins completely washed away. Having made Jesus your choice. And live the rest of your life serving, praising, and worshiping God. Friends, we want you to notice the numbers that are scrolling at the bottom of the screen. Notice the email. Call us. Email us right now. Right now, don't let anything deter you. Don't let anything dissuade you. Don't let anything distract you. Call us right now. Text us. Email us. Our operators are standing by. Someone's going to take your call. If you just need prayer, call us. Text us. Email us. We want to pray for you. We want to pray with you. Don't allow this opportunity to pass you by, friends. Call us. We want to help you make the right choice. It will save your soul. Friends, on behalf of the Church of Christ in Sandtown, West Baltimore, Maryland. I'd like to thank the many churches of Christ that supported our worship today and thank you for joining us. And friends, if you would like a personal Bible study or have any questions about anything you heard today, contact information for the Church of Christ in Sandtown and other churches of Christ in your area will be displayed at the end of this live stream. Friends, as always, we encourage you to please Visit a church of Christ near you. Visit a church of Christ near you. And you tell them that Brother Worley sent you. And friends, if you would like to support our worship right here in Sandtown, West Baltimore, Maryland, please note our GoFundMe page, our 
Cash App, our Zelle, uh, our PayPal. Just go to our homepage and you can make your contributions there. Friends, as always, we encourage you and the Church of Christ all over the world to keep the faith. Don't give up hope and know that God is willing and able to do all things. Friends, I am Evangelist Davis Worley. And until we meet again, God bless, keep, and comfort you and reveal the truth in his word that it might open your understanding and cause you to consider your relationship with God in Christ before it is eternally too late. Be blessed and be safe, my friend. I know that my mother No more pain